the jiu-jitsu scene is starting to openly talk about it. Unfortunately, it's started on a more glamorous trend of like, hey, I'm openly on steroids as Gordon Ryan. I'm nice and juicy. I don't care. Type Have you got any consideration for kids right now? And they're like, no. why would I be thinking about kids? I'm like, well, you've got a message. You've been with her. You're engaged, this type of thing, right? You doing this TRT dosage could then stop that from happening. The words PDs obviously start with performance. If there's no performance to enhance in the first place, you just don't should even consider it. Comes to another point, want to be an athlete, your nutrition should be checked. Should be getting appropriate sleep if possible based on structure, right? Training structure should be there. If you're turning up to the gym twice a week and that's a push, right? Don't give a fuck about what you're eating, barely getting any sleep, boozing on the weekend, grabbing some bag, whatever type thing, yeah? You then enhancing yourself on top of it isn't gonna outweigh the rest of it. I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to go to jiu-jitsu seven times a week. I'm going to go and do my S&C sessions on top of this. I'm also going to be meal prepping every single day. I'm going to be running every morning at the crack of dawn because who's going to carry these boats after all? Um, and one little thing will come up and it will just all collapse instantly. Right? People aren't aware of what can happen with this. And it'd be the case of, would you want to be shitting yourself on the mat, basically? Which is what could happen. And that could come from you taking on the electrolytes too soon. Right. Apparently, it's due to certain team members not making weight. So good old Mo jumped in and said, all right, we're going to change the rule set about this. Um, and the idea... <laughs> <laughs>
develop it further from there. And also work to weekly averages is probably my biggest tip as well, right? You can go as deep as monthly, three quarters, whatever you want to look at with that. But weekly averages are going to give you a lot more flexibility within our day-to-day lifestyle. And likewise, as jiu-jitsu practitioners, we all think we're going to fight Gordon next week, um, as always, even though it's never really going to happen for the majority of us. Um, don't treat yourself like some top-end athlete that's about to fight Gordon next week, basically. Yeah, the idea being is that we're going to have days where the kids play up, right? We're going to have days of really poor night's sleep for whatever reason because we're thinking about the next, I don't know, Baron Bolo we're going to be doing on someone. Um, we are going to have like ups and downs. And the idea being is if we can have an element of flexibility or what I refer to as the gray area as much as possible, then all of a sudden we're going to be in a much more agile way of dealing with things. Um, probably a little bit further down the line, kind of way I describe it is if you were to learn a new language, let's say like Spanish or something like this, your phrases will get you so far. Hey, how, how are you? Or like, hey, Tao, all that type of stuff, right? But for you to become more fluent and more, uh, is to be a skill for you, you've got to put engross yourself in this type of like, go and speak to the guy down the market and speak Spanish properly and learn how to make for me to just, uh, mistakes and adjust to them. So that then all of a sudden it's then, okay, fine. I've had a surprise meal out with a client at work all of a sudden. Calories are through the roof. I've got no idea what I've had. I've just had a lasagna, right? I've got no idea of it. If we're able to be agile and be like, oh, I'm going to write this day off, it means that then actually the following days, we may have a bit, little bit less food. Uh, the following days afterwards, we might have actually been prepared and have a bit more food on the lead up to it or less food so on. But be agile with those type of things. Other sort of mistakes that I commonly see is probably following a diet trend <laughs> is to put it put it into perspective my role as a nutritionist is to understand all the dieting different structures but there's some core basics when it comes into it obviously energy in versus energy out is the core basics when it comes to it how you decide to manipulate that there is multiple ways you can attack this in so many different ma- uh, fashions so if we were to use some other notable sort of i don't know uh, sporting figures tyson fury talked about many times about his preference for the keto diet or the carnivore diet as such um that could be just based on his food preferences. Yeah. Speaks to the guy, oh, do you know what? I don't actually need pasta. Mm. Don't really like rice. Not interested in potato. Give me a steak though. Love it. Right. And it makes me think that the way he talks about it and the way that his own nutritionist has pushed him into this sort of spectrum is that, is that based on his food preferences or is this more based on actually the keto diet? And my, my think, my, my thinking is the latter that he just prefers eating steak and bacon. Right. And so, Again, you could follow this dieting structure and get really into it quite far and have a little slip up somewhere and be like, oh, I've got offered a packet of crisp by Karen in the office all of a sudden I've had it. I'm now out of ketosis. Oh, what's the point for the rest of it? Again, it's like, okay, let's be realistic about this. Go back to the core basics of like energy balance is really, really simple for this. Uh, and it will allow then obviously for things to just progress onwards and it, take a bit more of a casual approach to it. Mm-hmm. People like to rush stuff. I think it's probably another big point. People want to see results within a week and I lose two stone or whatever it could be and you'll see things and I think this is a very good point in terms of marketing most people within any sort of service will always market the best results they've ever seen right if you're I don't know a PT or a nutritionist or something like that or before and after pictures that we do for example right there's pictures that I haven't posted out on social media not because I don't think they're good they've got their own sort of background there but What's going to get more eyes on? The guy that is, I don't know, put on a bit of muscle mass and looks marginally rounder type of thing and in the right places or the person who's gone from like really overweight to completely shredded all of a sudden. Our general public are going to look at that and kind of go, actually, that's way more like interesting with what's gone on here type of thing. Um, and so again, look at more realistic results. I mean, my point is that for me, most people on a fat loss journey or weight reduction journey, we're looking at one kilo a week. This one kilo a week is going to allow for us to hold on to as much muscle mass as possible. Being guys in jiu-jitsu and unfortunately our Lord and Savior Christ, Gordon Ryan, being nice and juicy as the way he looks. <laughs> um, he obviously holds a lot of muscle mass. We don't want to be losing that ideally, right? Likewise, on top of it, it shouldn't be too much of an issue in terms of hunger sensations that may come up as well uh, and then allow us obviously to progress on quite nicely. Now, does it need to be a kilo every single week? No, allow for some flexibility. If you're a week from hell, right? This is the other thing. Monday and Tuesday will come around obviously for January, maybe starting on a Wednesday. Let's be real. You're going to come back to at least like 400 plus emails from everyone right in the office going, "You can you do X, Y, and Z? All of a sudden you're then going, do you know what? I'm going to choose to starve myself all of a sudden on this day, theoretically, right? By having less food because I'm starting my new year, new me, and I'm going to go for a run. I've done everything else type of thing. 
why add that additional stress on top of a normal day-to-day life, right? Be a bit more flexible, maybe just have more of an average week type of thing compared to eating Toblerone or Trembolone or whatever you want to call it um, (laughs) throughout the rest of the week. And then like take it easy with the pigs and blankets that might be left over and likewise mince pies and stuff like that. Mm. So yeah, that's good advice, mate. And I've obviously mentioned that I was going to ask about veganism versus carnival yep and that was primarily because a lot of people this time of year do go fucking mental Stupid and they, diets, yeah, yeah they go with the extreme option so i guess that the question there really was you know are those sorts of diets effective and you've kind of answered it <laughs> yeah so it, the context is king with everything yeah. really with this and so effectiveness is gonna be kind of the key word that i'm kind of i'm gonna lean in on this now if I was going to be a jiu-jitsu athlete and I wanted to perform well, the carnival diet is not going to be optimal in the slightest bit, right? When we look at the general processes of what our body requires in terms of energy, we're looking for glucose, where glucose comes from, carbohydrates. And so depending on the activity that we're doing, let's say outside of jiu-jitsu, if you're going down ultra marathon running route, then there's an argument for fat content with the diet, helping us perform a little bit better and slow down the digestion of such things such as carbohydrates. But for the sport that we love and adore – you need immediate energy pretty quickly. Um, So the carnival diet would be a big no-no for it. But again, if we're talking just, I want to lose some weight, right? And I'm not too fussed about how the responsiveness of our activities go, i.e., I don't know, you come across someone who is a power lifter, let's say, right? We've all seen the joke of it. One rep, I'm going to rest for 20 minutes, have a read of the newspaper and get back to it type of thing. Sorry if I'm offending Danny. No, no, no. But do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's true though. Yeah, yeah, and have a rest. Hey, you could probably bank, you could probably, could you utilize, you could play around with the carnival diet, right? And just see how that goes. But for needing immediate energy and then trying to, rely on something called a process called gluconeogenesis which is where protein and fats get converted into glucose it's not going to happen just within a click of a switch right a pea stick will tell you a little bit but it's still again like do you when we go into the twist sorry guys i've got to check my next row and pee on a stick quickly do you know what i mean like it's not really going to go down well um so again with context with jiu-jitsu kind of a big no-no wouldn't really look on it i i can't solely say this forever because there's not any long-term studies with that diet yet to sort of confirm that there's nothing from it and i always use this example of like the keto diet falls fairly similar to the carnivore diet right however none of us knew that when they started doing the research that all of a sudden it would help with epileptic seizures for people right who have epilepsy and so i can't then say the keto diet is not for anyone if you have someone who's got epilepsy is receiving seizures from it a potential advice would be to try this keto diet and see if that makes any difference makes any superior the same thing could happen with carnival six months time from now it could be the fact that we've actually got another long-term study coming in that says hey do you know what actually this is reducing i don't know the cholesterol within our system because of it then hey we've got an argument to then take people off statin should we say and potentially look at this new diet veganism on the other hand um complete polar opposite in terms of it i think what can sometimes be misconstrued within the veganism dieting trend is there's different levels to it. If you want to, I would joke with that phrase when I think of the Simpsons, when I think Lisa went there and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a ve- vegan, like level five type thing. So I don't eat the shadows of certain food or foods that have <laughs> shadows. I'm like, right. Um, but again, in that plant-based environment, it depends on, like I said, on how far you're going down with it. If you're going with just, I don't want to touch any animal products at all, then fine. Then all we need to do is make sure that we're not micronutrient deficient in certain areas common ones being sort of B12, uh, not getting any, potentially enough fats within the diet as well uh, to help obviously the absorption of other micronutrients. And there's a few other sort of details that can come out the work what would work depending on which food groups you kind of go down. Um, and so again, you can overkill it as well. Again, just to scare people, but if you consume too much mango, you can have some severe problems like type of thing. So again, not to scare anyone of certain food groups in the slightest bit, it's just like you've got to understand what you're coming into. And then likewise on top of this again, plant-based diet, veganism, you can eat a load of shit on it quite easily from, again, highly processed food alternatives, which are in the same level. It's not like, oh, these are plant-based, highly processed foods, so they're going to be that much more superior. They're still highly processed, <laughs> right? It's still exactly the same thing. I appreciate with some of the more fake alternatives out there, and I don't want to say fake as in a negative way, but they're going to require some element of processing because there's no way you're going to make mushrooms look like bacon, in my opinion, right, without some sort of processing, but it's something to consider with that. And so I think as a nutritionist, it would be the case of I'm a big advocate. Everyone needs to eat more fruit and veg. That's a, a very big stance to like a uh, statement across the board, I'd say. Uh, however, do we need to be fully plant-based to be more superior? Possibly not. Uh, in terms of jujitsu, um, lots of carbohydrates in the plant-based diet. 
so again we could utilize things like honey for example quite easily um honey and rice cakes obviously are very fantastic i think dante leon was seen obviously on his um last sort of flow debut eating a lot of those type of thing before competing which is again easily digestible high gi coming straight in there lots of pretty things for performance also good for actual numbers on the scales so again if you wanted to make weight or structure work by trying to break the barriers of it it's really quite a light level of food for a lot of like energy in there so again if you people trying to make weight and stuff not saying live off rice cakes and honey but it's another thing you can sort of incorporate in there to keep weight down it's fish and rice cakes isn't it (laughs) fish and a rice cake (laughs) we were were talking about this earlier making a rash guard and be like bjj nutrition meal plan fish and a rash (laughs) (laughs) however i have been informed that the guy who did that is actually quite jacked now and actually quite big and got multiple businesses and stuff fair play to it yeah Yeah. it's legendary though isn't it yeah Yeah. so a couple of bits i wanted to pick up there so the carnival diet was an interesting one Mm -hmm. because i actually tried this uh, a few months back Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I originally tried it because we had a guest on who was talking a, a lot around sort of um, injury prevention and, and reducing inflammation. So I tried it for a bit and initially my, my fucking joints felt great. I yep. got like an elbow issue and my hands are fucked. So it really helped with that. And lifting, I felt just a lot stronger through the joints. But we literally were talking recently that during Today, that period, it? yeah, during that period when I was when I was training, I was just fucked. Like no energy on the mats, was getting sick a lot as well. So I'd, I'd already come to the conclusion that maybe the carnival diet wasn't the best option for, for jiu-jitsu. So it's, it's, it's good to hear you confirm that. It's interesting. I went, again, I went just straight to powerlifting. So again, I'm just thinking again of like that whole lifting environment that in terms of utilizing carbohydrates instantaneously, it's not as intense as like CrossFit or jiu-jitsu or something like that. So you could see why. I think at one point I probably will pick up on with the carnival diets. There was uh, someone locally to us who went down this route and he again also had joint issues and like particularly in his knees and stuff and hips. And I came up with a bit of a hypothesis, which I'm interested in. So the idea being is by following the carnival diet, probably very minimal carbohydrates in there is what I presume. So your mass would then look to reduce probably somewhat. So did you check your weight by any chance? Did yeah, come dropped, down? Down quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, probably about half stone to stone sort yeah. of region, yeah. yeah. Now, when we look at the basic measures of pressure on our hips and knees, for example, our knees will have uh, four pounds of pressure per pound on them and our hips then get to eight pounds of pressure on them. Now, if you were to reduce your mass by, let's say, all of a sudden half a stone being seven pounds, then all of a sudden, quick mass, this is not going to go well, eight, 16, 24, 32. We've just now taken 32 pounds of pressure off your knees, mm-hmm. right? We then obviously then we do eight times seven, which I can't do off the top of my head right now. We've then obviously taken a sort of significant amount of pressure off your hips. And so he then said that by following the carnival diet, these these issues then relieve themselves. And so my argument is, is it coming from anti-inflammation or is it because we've reduced the amount of pressure on your body parts which are having problems type of thing? So again, jury's out. There's no official research on stuff until that does happen. It will be interesting to see. And likewise, for those people who like to wear their tin hats type of thing, someone's going to have to fund it, be that the plant-based community or the meat community. Mm. Someone's going to have to look into it eventually. But you know, that's interesting. There. Yeah. And then the other thing was obviously back to veganism. The, the the big thing that I hear about that is obviously around the protein and mm-hmm. specifically around sort of the leucine content of some of yep. the, the proteins that you typically would eat with a plant-based diet yep. and not hitting that threshold to, to produce uh, the sort of uh, signal muscle protein synthesis. Yep. So would that would that be a, an issue that you would see potentially on the mats where someone's maybe not getting enough protein and therefore can't maintain their, their muscle or their strength? Yes, that's something you need to, again, sort of details you need to be considerate of. Again, in particular, leucine, as you kind of put up there, the way I best describe that, that amino is basically the commander to tell everything else in the body to crack the fuck on with it and start repairing and recovering from it. Now, there are lots of alternatives out there to get that leucine content. Um, not to plug him on here, but obviously Shane Curtis, Goff Lord, um, client of ours, and obviously who we've been working with, fully plant-based, right? things like this we've considered with him and so yes he has to use additional supplementation for his like competitive schedule which is basically every weekend uh when he gets the chance or again like it might be a bit quiet right now before we build up into the season again but it can be managed but it's again something you need to be aware of i think a lot of people will come into these dieting cultures and think oh, i'll just try this and just see how this goes type of thing you need to take these things because you can do yourself some harm i'm not saying yeah. you're not getting enough leucine in your diet it's going to be like you're going to lose a bicep overnight but you may find all of a sudden you're not recovering as well right as guys we obviously want to keep muscle mass as much as high as possible so again it will take a prolonged period of time of like completely doing this to then have that outcome from it um and likewise again like i said soreness on the mat and stuff like that from there but um no leucine something to consider but we can supplement with it really yeah what's just like a simple bc bcaa just be enough 
again, that's an interesting point. So BCAs are going to have like a general broad uh, mix of amino acids in there. Um, you probably want more something like EAAs, which is essential amino acids, which will have specifically leucine along with a few other ingredients in there. So uh, again, to Shana's example here, he particularly has a particular brand, obviously, of uh, essential amino acids to keep that topped up along with that. Uh, you can get leucine from other foods. The issue you typically get is that when we look at other food groups, you're going to have to take a, a high amount of it to then cons- to get the right levels for it. So as if we were to compa- uh, compare a normal diet of, I don't know, chicken breast with leucine in there, there's quite a significant amount. I think even your, your daily requirements, even just one chicken breast from memory serves me correctly. But what we'll have in, let's say from broccoli, for example, you're going to have to eat like three kilos worth of the stuff, which on an average day like there's only so much you can get through like and that's the reality behind it but it also i like to remind people if you look at gorillas for example they're big they're juicy right they eat a lot of plants they're getting their leucine from somewhere and it can be done but the thing that we do miss is that we see that and and uh, end picture of the big juicy gorilla but he's there eating all day every day non-stop basically until he's moving to i don't know go to sleep somewhere so and then just staying on the trend i guess of of weight loss um so again we, we've kind of touched on this already um but i guess if someone so we talked about some of the i guess limitations of both both diets now but mm-hmm. i'm a jiu-jitsu guy i'm looking to you know sort of perform on the mats but i'm trying to lose weight yep i mean if i was your client for example what would you typically what sort of diet i don't have any specialist requirements i, I don't have a particular you know sort of feeling around one diet or another what what's the general approach for, for sort of weight loss while maintaining performance? Sure. So I think first part of all comes back to that kind of what I mentioned in terms of what people should do and uh, in understanding what's happening. So I refer to this as like the blueprint generation. So week one to 10 days, I kind of say, right, mate, you go and do Yubo. Right? I just want to see what's going on first of all. Right. And that point is like collecting as much information as possible what you're weighing, what food you're consuming, at what times, what are the jiu-jitsu sessions like, anything else in between, what's your sleep like, what other medication you could be on, just generate a big picture of like what is your life and what's going on. And then from there, I kind of say, right, okay, let's have a look at what these trends are going. You might be unknowingly under-eating already, right? And so it's the case of going, okay, well, let's get some feedback from yourself, right? When you went to jiu-jitsu, how are the energy levels, all this type of jazz? And then so relaying that feedback from there, we then start to tweak stuff. So if I look at general jujitsu population, majority of people underfeed themselves and then they binge significantly on certain days, be that the weekend, be that with family or so on, uh, or they'll build up to a certain level of hunger sensations and go, like, oh my God, I'm starving. I haven't eaten all week and then eat loads more. Uh, so we have an issue there. And then we then look to level that up. And so it's quite a nice conversation say look mate you're under eating here can we just get a few more extra meals or can we bulk out these meals with maybe some more protein more fibers etc and then we go for another reassessment we go for another 10 days we then see like what's going on here so again referring back to sort of jujitsu context here is if i told you how to do the hitch or you told me how to do the hitchhiker escape like i said um you then say right go and try this in open mat go and try this in class whatever and then come back to me a week later and tell me what were the problems how did it go now majority of time with the little bits of advice that you would have given there would be some good successes however there would have been other hurdles that would have come up oh i did the hitchhiker escape but then he he crossed his feet on it all of a sudden around my neck so i couldn't escape what do i do now same thing with the, the dieting approach is that we keep gathering this information consistently and start to then build this up. And so the idea being is if we can build such a solid foundation of, okay, his movement is X, his food intake is Y, uh, his macronutrient profile is Z, uh, his stress levels are B and everything else. And then the idea being is about attacking the foundations more regularly. Because if I can get your worst day from 10% efficient to 15% efficient, it's going to be that worst day is going to happen more regularly than you having that perfect day once or twice a year type of thing. And then all of a sudden, if you look at those awful days throughout the year, they're going to come out way more often. And then I've also made now 5% more stronger because of it. And then from there, it's building that confidence around it because that's another very key point with this all. People try stuff, don't get the result of it immediately and switch off. That's it, isn't it? Yeah, every, every time. Like you, I, it always reminds you of that image of that miner. Um, the two miners actually, one's digging away, digging away, digging away, and then you see another miner above him, like facing the opposite direction with his like pickaxe above mm-hmm. him. There's a load of diamonds the other side of the wall. It's the same thing. Nor even that sort of two to three day sort of protocol. People want to see results straight away. Now, if the results aren't coming, it comes with like a lack of confidence. To say, oh, I don't believe what's happening, and so 
when we start to see those cracks appear, right, and the results don't come, people then get unmotivated. And then that's when obviously we get issues of like adherence and stuff like this. So very common phrase you guys might have heard already, but most people think motivation comes wrong, which then leads into action, which then leads into results. And it's not in that pattern. It's okay, we need clear actions that give you clear results, which you as a client are content with. And that could be one pound a week. It could be one pound every two weeks, whatever the, the outcome is, yeah. And then from there, it's in, right, I'm now getting the results I want. I now feel motivated. And it all comes back to those clear actions. And so what we're doing within that first sort of two to three weeks or building up is giving you really clear actions to go, go and do this, right? Your movement is absolutely god awful. You're on a desk job all day. We need to act upon it because, do you know what, in within a lifestyle, rather than park out the front office of here, you can park down the road and walk on in a little bit more, right? And that then contributes to how that. Do you, how do you um, measure expenditure on the mats? That's one thing I'm always really interested on, especially with the lads, because they train so fucking much. Get a yeah. whoop, get a whoop. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going well, to say. Well, so pants. other than a whoop or whatever, <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you factor that in? Obviously, expenditure in and out. And then the amount people are training, do you, do you factor that in at all? So we can use the averages of what some people are doing, right? And this is a very generic sort of approach mm -hmm. in the sense that if I've got, I don't know, a, a rooster weight guy, right? And I've obviously know people who've got whoops or have had a similar sort of experience with my zone or whatever brand it could be. Uh, we can obviously try and base it slightly off that as an, as an indicator. But there's an element of, okay, well, I need the feedback based on how the role is going. Not so what the weight loss results are, if that makes sense. The weight loss results are gonna be a combination of different variables. Now, if your weight loss results are based on one role per day, I'd be highly concerned that the other metrics aren't in shape. And it, it sort of comes back to people getting concerned about how to understand a meal out, for example. My advice to them is saying, look, your results are not gonna be pinnacle based on one meal. Yeah, be that burger, be that pizza. If we're basing it on like a hundred calorie difference all of a sudden, your results are going to be really, really, really slow, right? And so again, map performance, it, it depends. Like I said, we'll probably come into this a little bit later, but if we're looking to lose weight off the mats and the rolls, that's just included in the day-to-day -day exercise, right? Uh, and then what that comes in at, if they need to know the expenditure of it, then fine, we can take some stabs at it without relying on sort of data and stuff. But it will have to be, again, sort of, slightly generic advice not to be horrible when saying that but it's going to be the case of right maybe have like a lucas aid sport afterwards just to refuel yourself and replenish yourself but again we have to take consideration the other metrics of what are we trying to achieve if it's fat loss for example whilst there then as i kind of mentioned sports performance doesn't start with a deficit right that and that's a real key thing that people get lost in it's like i'm active i need to be eating for performance there's levels to that don't get me wrong but you eating for four and a half thousand calories a day, I'm expecting you to be training two to three times a day, right? Be yeah. really active all of a sudden, not moving like, and being constantly on the move. Unfortunately, we get lost up in seeing, well, Eddie Hall loses four, have, loses four and a half thousand calories. Well, that's correct, but he's also training three, four times a day, really bloody hard. Uh, and that's where we kind of lose it out. Yeah, I was, just, I was just interested because some people are really strict on shit like that. Yeah. You know, so you get bodybuilding coaches and other people where they're like, we need to know exactly their expenditure to then calculate what's coming in you know and, and they are like you know neat and making sure they're getting enough steps and all that sort of stuff but it, unless you have got a whoop and every every role of jujitsu is kind of different as well when we can do an hour and it's like full pelt and it's we, we must burn fucking 1500 calories so i could do other sessions i'll do 500 i think the kind of difference from the bodybuilding world so again i have been aware of these coaches that would do that of course yeah, yeah. them years and that type of thing the environment that they're involved with all of a sudden right is a lot more easy to measure right mm -hmm. yeah i can send you footage of me doing a leg press right and you can correct me quite quickly on biomechanics of it whatever and what my intensity of rpa it wouldn't surprise me if we see ai on that soon do you know what i mean or like right. what's the <laughs> rpa of this person or well, the ai is saying you needed seven well we need you need to get you to nine before we start changing things um and so i think from that standpoint it's a lot more easy to measure and then the ideas of what the feedback would be in terms of like hrv recovery rate we can utilize those tools and so I think for us to pinpoint whilst doing jujitsu uh, without the tools in place would be very tricky, basically, I think, to answer that. I'd just use that as a tool. I would. I'd be like, just leave it to one side and focus on every other Everything aspect. Yeah. And then that's just extra if you're trying to lose weight or, you know, you said for performance or whatever <laughs> it is. I remember doing the math, I think it was the other day. Do you, ever, you guys ever heard of Matt Inman by chance? Mm -hmm. Right. So he competed, I think it was like 162 times this year, just gone before he had the... Uh, the joyous uh, <laughs> jump guard knee pop. Did you see that? No. 
Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, God. Long story oh, short, no. someone, someone jumped guard on him in the gay and his leg hyperextended, basically. But, like, knee went, foot went that way. And he's done it to people. Other people have done it to him. No issues. It was just a freak accident. But he put up his stats because, obviously, he's like, I'm done for the year. This only happened, again, a few weeks back, I think it was. Um, and I did the math based on how much time you spend on a competition map. Uh, the math will based on how much time you'll be drilling, if that makes sense. And that was like, was it two hours each and every day? I think it was. So again, quite a bit more than your average old hobbyist. Yeah, sure. And I think it came up to something like 6% of the whole year. Mm. And I was like, you look at your lifestyle, which then came in at something like 79 to 82%. I'm like, why do people focus in on this like 6% when you've got this 79% over here, which if you just sorted out your sleep is going to make a massive difference over here. If you see what I mean, or get your diet in check or start looking at things that matter. But so little things like getting up to like 17, 18, 18,000 steps a day or buying six, six to 800 calories a day just by doing that. Yeah. Just by doing that. Like don't even fucking walk in a gym, just do that. And that will give you a big deficit just straight off without even trying it's interesting because the jiu-jitsu community i find sometimes will shun that type of thing because 100%. Oh, king, what's that all about? i said right okay let's be really realistic right we're all prone to injuries right the chance of you getting an injury is on a walk and, this, and we're not talking like hiking and uh, about yeah. rest we're just talking just go and walk your shops or whatever what yeah. kind of treadmill <laughs> <We're all> tre- <laughs> you know what I mean? get netflix yeah. on whatever it could be yeah um the idea being is that just that's gonna be so low impact right we then chuck on the fact that hey if you've got Fair is getting a bit not super technical, but if your gait's good, then obviously you should be stretching everything out. We're moving, opening up your hips from where we've been curled up in a ball like this all the time, right? We look at the mental health aspects of getting out and about. Don't get me wrong with saying it's pissing down the rain that you need to be there, like who's going to carry the boats type of thing. I need to get my steps in, as I always say. But um, it's just going to be really beneficial. But people just don't see those metrics. Like you said, that's 6,800 calories. Would you want to sit on a salt bike every day and do that? I wouldn't fucking bother. Like, no. like two days in, I'm like, nah, I'm done. <laughs> like, it's I never do it. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. literally like yeah. it's just no point. Yeah. So again, it's about that blueprint and using that step count as a perfect example is to kind of then say like, okay, well, we can optimize and utilize as much as possible. Then why not? Yeah. Like, well, I think it's, it's been consistent with that as well. So people yeah. do like a Monday to Thursday of yeah, I'm in my ten thousand steps, and Friday, Saturday, Sunday comes, they fucking throw it out the window. Nothing happens. You know what I mean? They, they don't do anything. They three days then, and then that step count over a week, the average, yep, is fucking shit then. You yep. know, and that's what they fucking miss all the time. Yeah, I think when you're talking about jujitsu guys, though, you just need to convert that to bum scooting calories. <laughs> so if you could do like a comparison or a conversion, <laughs> just bum scoot. Yeah, like, just fucking. How many bum scoots? Yeah, how many bum scoots you got to do to fucking burn your let's, calories? Let's, let's, let's make 2024 the bum scooting era where you see people outside <laughs> just staring apart like, hey. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, that fucking get them on board. Um, so on on the tone of optimization of training, then. Yeah. Um, you've covered loads already, mate, so thank you. Sorry. Um, no, it's good. No, it's good. Um, mate. Yeah, I love so it. So for, for things like, I don't know, do you, do you go as deep as measuring like sweat, sweat rate and, and thinking about hydration? Is that something you consider? So I have done, yeah. right? And again, this comes to the context. I know we were talking off air about this, depending on who the individual that you're dealing with is, right? Majority of us are not going to fight Gordon Ryan, right? And so understanding sweat rates is obviously not necessarily going to be the pinnacle of it, right? If we look at generalized advice, most of us will be underhydrated for the majority we do. We don't utilize electrolytes as much as so we should do. Um, and so, again, back to your original question, if I had an athlete who's going to Worlds or fighting one ADCC trials, things like that, which we do, we take that into consideration, especially for those type of matches, purely for the fact that there could be multiple matches across the day. And so, unbeknown to some people, you can be DQ'd in a match for having a muscle cramp uh, in IBJJF rules. So all of a sudden, do you want to have that variable looming over your head along with all the other issues that come along with being dehydrated? Probably not, right? Uh, not to get too serious, but again, dehydrated, yes, we're not a complete physical punch kick contact sport, but we've all faced the planet the floor a few times at some point. We're then dehydrated. We're then going to rattle our brain. I can I put my hand up quite easy and say so I felt like I've had a few concussions here and there type of thing. Hasn't affected me massively, I don't think. <laughs> oh, I'm so, well, you're both looking at me smiling like, oh, he's channeling shit again. Um, but the idea being is that, again, it depends on the extremities of where people want to go. And I'm going to say this politely, there's a lot of blue belts out there who think they are the next Gordon Ryan and there's other belts out there and they compete very regularly, which is great. And it's like, okay, fine, we'll, look, we'll cover this for you. But it depends on how well that progression is, right? I think we've all met people in their, let's say, early 30s who say, who think like, oh, yeah, I can make a career out of this. And it's like, oh, you might be really a bit mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> I am making no career out of it. Other than no illusions. <laughs> and it comes to light, it's like, okay, fine then. Do you need to be worrying about 
how much your sweat your sweat rate is which again we can calculate which is fine it's no issue at all it's quite a very simple test for people out there um do you want me to share no, it, it no fuck no. that if you're saying it's not worth it then unless you're <laughs> unless you're elite and that's not yeah i'd say like i said if you've got aspirations of like if you're gonna be you really wanting to do like worlds euros like pans that type of thing then yeah consider it yeah and use that as a kind of not say as a precursor for who you're speaking to for your advice but they should be considering that type of stuff yeah so i guess to simplify the question and if if you if if, if i'm just a hobbyist going to the gym um sweating a, f- a good amount what what do i want to be drinking like post-workout cool. you know when you talked about electrolytes and not utilizing that enough what, what should i be so again pre- on the presumption that we're not trying to lose weight or anything like that so it's just a normal performance side of things then we're looking to obviously replenish uh, particularly uh, the carbohydrates so we're looking obviously at high gi carbohydrates gonna be the fastest to get back into our system um and then from there we're going to need some proteins in there we don't particularly want any fats within that section due to the fact that it's going to slow down the absorption process majority of the time now uh, and then electrolytes we're going to have to replenish them now there's a few easy ones to go to it would be like a lucasade sport bottle i always kind of like remind people that when we go to the olympics and stuff what do you see all the athletes there taking around with them just lucasade sport everywhere or powerade or all the equivalent of right um, you can go and get a electrolyte sort of powdered or tablet form. The big advice and tip I give to people is that, especially in the tablet form with some of them, not to name any brands, that they're quite low in dosaging in terms of what's needed. And you'll have to take like four to eight tablets to replenish what would be typically lost. Um, and as with anything, a little bit too much can start to taste a bit naff, a little bit excessive. So yeah, not to plug myself here, but drop me a message if you need to know. Obviously, there's certain brands out there which I recommend over over others, and it's not because I'm affiliated with them. It's just because I'd rather have one scoop of something and be done with it rather than have eight tablets of something. Do you see what I mean? But yeah, Lucas Sport Sports probably going to be the easiest thing to replenish. The reason, again, we're kind of hitting hydration factors as well. Other things to consider is if we've lost a kilo of sweat, which is pretty common for most guys. There's some outliers out there who do less and milk more. Uh, you need to be looking at 1.5 liters of fluid, basically. And when I mean fluid, it can be anything, really. I uh, hate to sort of bring this up to some degree, but like when we take up things like Coca-Cola, for example, that actually has a higher hydration factor than water. Um, so again, can be utilized. Things like milk, coconut oil, things like that can be used as well. So um on top of the question, it's then context in terms of when are they training? What's the schedule like? Is this like, do we want to be consuming more hydration because it's first part of the morning or is it lasting the night? Are we traveling to work? Can we take liquids where we go to? If we've got, I don't know, someone who works in a, in a primary school, for example, that like they can't have liquids on site. So again, other things taken context, but that should be the core crux of about 1.5 liters of fluid. What that comes from is up to you. Lucasade is going to have the electrolytes in there along obviously with some glucose in there. Uh, otherwise, we can get powders to replace that being electrolyte powders or we can get uh, citrulline dextrose would be what the equivalent of a carbohydrate powder would be. Uh, and then just finally on, on, on optimizing p- performance for a hobbyist, I guess. So I'm, I'm a you know busy, I've got, a, I've got a day job, I've got kids. I kind of run around during the day. I skid into training. But you skip, are you skipping skipping warm up as well being a purple belt? <laughs> no, mate. You skip training. He needs mate. extra warm up. <laughs> 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 <Just> skip training. <laughs> um, if if I'm uh, you know my, my my nutrition for example, I'm just hypothesizing here a little bit, but uh, my nutrition's not great during the day. I just grab eat on, eat on the go, and then I want to kind of perform well at training. Is there like anything that you would typically say to people if you know you, if you're not on top of your nutrition, you're just a normal person? Like, what would you throw down your neck? an hour before training to, to get some good energy would it just be a banana or some haribo like yeah like both of those are fine examples for it um if you want to get super technical which i know obviously we're talking contacts are just like hobbyists here then both of those will have slightly little bit more delay time in terms of less delay time in terms of what they are and um, what i refer to as is basically called the glycemic index right if you want to be proper rogue and arnold style just go and spoon in some honey in your mouth type thing like 15 minutes before jumping on the mat type thing or a squeezy bottle rather than spooning you know what i mean um you can obviously look at other food groups for it which again i try and utilize that time to if i am trying to help optimize someone's diet along with a few other issues that may be behind the scenes so typically in the jiu-jitsu scene we've got a very big issue of like good and bad foods for the moment would be then be like right what foods do you consider as bad quote unquote and can we utilize that and so things like haribo are going to be really easy, easy to sort of then go like well, well we've got a reason to then consume this before the performance type of thing and so that makes it a little bit more easier anything else that comes to mind luke's sport again we can use that in nice and high gi uh sugary drinks such as like orange juice apple juice pineapple juice quite easy as that especially like if you're on the move to keep that in your car in that little car and obviously if people got kids they've probably had them a thousand times type of thing 
really easy just to neck one of those quickly. Um, my go-to personal one, <laughs> which takes a bit of preparation but nothing much, is uh, peanut butter and jam sandwiches. Mm-hmm. Like, best thing ever. You can have them cold, to be fair, but just have it pre-made. Two pieces of bread, a bit of uh, jam, a bit of fat on there, and in terms of the butter, uh, peanut butter that is, and that's going to be more than optimal. Um, but yeah. You said you could have them cold? Yeah. Opposed to what? Opposed to what? Just, well, having it freshly done as in the, the bread's being warm and toast. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I've never had <laughs> peanut, peanut butter and jam sandwiches toasted. You're missing out. Trust really? Me. Am yeah, I? Like, okay. If you wanted peak male performance, mate, that's what you <laughs> go for. Like, every single time. That's mate. what I've been fucking going on for 40 years. Bro. <laughs> nice, mate. Good. All right. So, New Year's done. People people have got tons there to crack on with. Looking forward, we've always got ADCC coming up in February. So you mentioned just a second ago, I think that you've got a couple of athletes that you work with that are maybe looking to do that. Um, I mean, what's what's the kind of, what's the thoughts around prep there and, and things like weight cutting and everything else? Tell us everything. Can't wait to get into this. Um, go on, go. So we've had a rule set change, obviously, uh, over the last couple of competitions. I'll, I'll, just, I'll cause a bit of drama. Apparently, it's due to certain team members not making weight. So good old Mo jumped in and said, all right, we're going to change the rule set about this. Um, and the idea, <laughs> why not? Of course, I'm driving Tom. Um, so yeah, basically about where they're going to make weights. They're flying into Europe to do the uh, Polish trials. And so they then changed it to a night before where now I got this message. I think it was on the Monday. I think it was when it was that. And then I was like, these guys are waiting in on Friday night and some of them aren't even traveling in. I was like, Oh God, all systems go. So I was messaging between clients, like who's got a set of scales with them, who can share with sauna and try and get more to collaborate with each other and we had some clients who were due to fight each other as well based on brackets that look guys you might not be fighting it depends on how your bracket gets drawn just help each other out but sorry back to my point ADTC trials we've got the night before when now it's not a full day before when and so we can't treat it like MMA stuff which is where we can like shift up to 10% of people's body weight uh, throughout that whole process um, so I'm trying to advise people to go marginally less to it and it's not just because I'm trying to be nanny state it's because we don't have any official research to say, right, this is a safe weight pro, uh, safe weight cutting protocol. We have to rely on other sort of sports that are closely related to it, like judo, wrestling, stuff like that, and then try and then put a spin on it. And again, it gets even more complex when we look at former uh, female like physiologi- uh, physiology as well, in the sense that if they're on their period or not, that can obviously make and change things, yeah? Massively fluctuate stuff. So again, is trying to make sure that we're going into this new realm of weigh-ins. What was it, it like before? Uh, it was the same day. Right, okay. So it wasn't as, as, strict, as strict as IBJJF. It would be like your typical classic competition of like turn up in the morning, all right, weigh in, might be on at four, might be on at 10, whatever type of thing. Uh, but that's what it would be. And again, for the trials in Vegas, you'd have to re-weigh the following day. So there was also discussions of people coming off the mat after they've just done day one of trials and got through to like the quarters or the semis type of thing, and then jumping straight into saunas after having scraps of people to then remake weight, then taking IVs after they've made weight the following day to then there. So it's a lot of behind the scenes, closed doors that people don't aren't aware of, but they're utilizing a lot of stuff, which if you look at other big federations such as the UFC, they're, they're not doing it like that because they have regulations and stuff in place. But with ADCC, they've now got this night before where people should be taking advantage of it. But I say that with, I don't know what the word would be. Um, I say it with like some reserved comments before and like some like stipulations. Think about that 5% marker. So where you're walking out of the week before, you can safely reduce your weight by 5% and then bring it back up to rehydrate and refuel if you're weighing in the night before. There will be people who will take the mic and will try and do more. Now, I say, look, kudos to you. If you want to trial that and obviously do that on the day of your big event of competing and being in Vegas underneath the shining lights, I wouldn't risk it, right? You could end up fucking up absolutely everything and having an absolute horrific time refuel and rehydrate and stuff like that. And people aren't aware of what can happen with this. And it'd be the case of, would you want to be shitting yourself on the map, basically, which is what could happen. And that could come from you taking on the electrolytes too soon, right? And this is the problem because, again, instructors of clubs and people who look after these people who are above these people aren't qualified in that. And that's not to discredit that they don't know what they're doing, but there's new research that comes out and obviously helps them with this. And there's some timings around this and we're getting some more in good information around it. So if you want to go to do trials and want to do well at it and everyone goes to do trials to win because no one turns out just to be a number on it and pay just to see what it's like, right? Then 
<clears throat> take advantage of it, speak to a professional, reach out to myself or whoever it may be, to then say, look, we can give this advantage to you so you can drop in safely, rehydrate the following day, and then just go and smash as much as you want type of thing. Yeah, yeah okay. So with... with- I, I kind of just throw around the term weight cutting like everybody knows what it is. And I think <laughs> yeah. in this room, everybody obviously knows what it is and many listening will. But just for those that maybe aren't aware, it's it's a water cut, isn't it? Is that right? So the term weight cutting is, is, is an interesting one. So if we – where do I start with this? So within fight week, there's multiple things that we will do to manipulate someone's weight, right? The weight cut technically starts – a lot further out so you're looking at six to eight weeks out right and that would be potentially from diet right to manipulate things um when it comes to sort of the final week uh so the the penultimate week before the final week right we'd actually change things nutritionally wise uh and sort of load people up full of things now this is obviously contextual the fact that everything's on plan we don't just change anything else we're like ahead of schedule and stuff but in sort of weeks, let's say this is all, it's all from eight weeks here. So eight weeks, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, right? You could be in a slight deficit. Let's say if you were shifting a bit of timber or you could be just maintaining your weight for that. It depends on which bracket you're going to go into. So I'll use an example. We've got a couple of clients who are floating around sort of 95, 96 at the moment. They've got aspirations of getting down to 88 for trials, um, obviously in February. Like me. Perfect. We'll get you ready for this, ready, mate. You're going to win it. Just remember to take it to Vegas, right? <laughs> so, what we need to do then, obviously, for those first few weeks is obviously start chipping away at that sort of kilo mass, right? We look at 5% difference in terms of 88. Our sort of goal marker is going to be somewhere between 93 and 94, right? The penultimate week before the final week is when we actually say, right, we're going to hold off on the fat loss type of thing. We're going to fuel you up for the food. Uh, and the reason being is that if we're going to manipulate things the following week, we need to manipulate from something, right? If I'm going to take, I don't know, 5 kg off of you, you've got to have 5 kg in you to take away in the first place. And so if you've got no fluid in you, no carbohydrates, no fiber, no nothing, right? I can't take away something from nothing. So the penultimate week we would fill someone up nicely and it's not say to excess right and then the idea being is we then look to manipulate things on that final week now the final week is when things obviously get a little bit more rigid a little bit more structured and i'd say that we're going to start probably see some jiu-jitsu guys embrace that mma weight cut a little bit more but shouldn't be too too extreme and that's when we look to then manipulate fiber we then look to manipulate carbohydrates we then look to manipulate water so water the weight cutting obviously gets confused with water cutting. That's done at the final, final stages. We also have something called water loading, which again leads to manipulating that. And that's to do with uh, a, cha- a, a change of hormone profile within the body. Put it bluntly, we feed you full of water, you pee more. Um, to put it into put it there for a not too complex context type of thing. Um, but again, we water load. And so again, that will then obviously put the weight up and it will then bring it back down again accordingly. So nice and lots full of water. Then we can cut it off at a certain point and you start urinating it all out same thing with fiber we then reduce fiber down sodium we keep an eye on because again sodium is kind of like the key ingredient for glucose to get into your muscles and so typically again when we see quite muscular guys in the ufc for example they make really big weight cuts because they've got more to take out from the muscular groups uh and then again obviously food portions we have to then take consideration of the food weight itself type of things then bring that down now you start taking these into the consideration which we would do for like an mma cut for a day before when yeah, you can move someone's weight by 10% quite significantly. So for viewers and listeners out there, it'd be like, if a guy was 90, uh, wanting to make 90 kg for whatever reason, he could be walking around at 99 kg the day before the weigh-in type of thing, and then it would all come down nicely and then refuel again for the following day. Well, that seems fucking crazy, though, to the regular person. Nine, nine, 10 kilos, doesn't it? It does. You, they, they look at it and they're like, how? You know, how? But I think the big thing as well is obviously water loading. You know, you, you do that all properly. But I think... I think it's just dangerous if it's not done right. And that's why someone like yourself who knows what they're doing, I see a load of lads like in gyms in general and they just do it so fucking badly. You know what I mean? They're trying to, they're trying to cut three kilos and they're trying to water, water cut three kilos. They don't understand that they could, they could do 10, you yeah. know, and, and that's the fucking problem. This is the scary thing. I, I, I voiced this before, obviously about how we've seen some big stars. Uh, again, this is not to chill them the slightest bit, but Jacob Couch had a call up to go on one of the shows back in, I think it was 2020, I think it was. And he had some big names on the car. This is when he was just up and coming um, as the hillbilly hammer. And, he said, look, you've got to be this way. And he had to shift, I think it was something like 13 kilograms in 24 hours, right? I think it was a bit more than that. But yeah. the idea being is that he then went and got an IV drip afterwards, right? 
you, you <laughs> unless you know the right people, and it's depending on which federation you're in, you may not be allowed a IV drip, basically. If you go to UFC standard, not allowed, right? They all like to accuse each other. Oh, I saw Khabib with an IV drip. And it was like, oh, sure, whatever. Um, but same thing, obviously, within IBJJF. Same thing, obviously, in ADCC. ADCC is a little bit more cowboyish in the sense that I don't think there's any regulations around IVs, but it could come into play. And it, it comes back to a point that... I think as it's getting bigger, it will. Yeah. I think as ADCC keeps growing, Jiu-Jitsu keeps growing, it, it's becoming more of a spectacle. It will definitely... They will... They will well, certain they will sponsors won't want to be associated with them unless it's regulated. Yeah, of so course, yeah. It's, I always use this example of like Reebok coming to the UFC. The UFC changing its stance on sort of like testing within steroids and stuff uh, and getting USADA in was based on that Reebok deal alone, right? And so then Reebok came in cleaned up the sport because they didn't want to be associated with a dirty sport and I can see why Nike and Adidas would want to do exactly the same thing right you're going to get a lot of funding for that all of a sudden and then yeah obviously typical the Reebok deal kind of lapsed and all of a sudden testing went and gone all of a sudden but as it gets bigger ADCC and obviously again I'm not quite sure how it's structured in terms of who owns it and stuff without sort of taking stab in the dark it's a bit shady and stuff because I think someone said the other day that Mo owns New Wave as well uh, yeah yeah which is like oh okay cool this is interesting <laughs> and so again one thing i'm trying to tell people is we know what the trials are doing at the moment in terms of like qualifying for it with day before don't be solely reliant on the finals potentially changing it again yeah they may give you a full day before when and that's the one it they may turn around and say do you know what same day when now and if you then become heavily reliant on being that way then and dropping down for it you can end up doing yourself a detriment to it type of thing but I think the other thing to consider with a lot of people who look at trying to do these things is that, again, back to this context, we are not fighting Gordon Ryan next week. Yeah. yeah. And that's what gets lost in it. And don't get me wrong, I love competing. I love being involved with it all and stuff like this. But you've got to find a balance of this. Of like, you are just Steve who goes and work, obviously, in a recruitment center yeah. for Monday. And guess what? Karen next year is going to be like, what medal is that? Oh, cool. Nice. That's it. And it'll be back to normal again. Not, not to, not to shit on it, no. but that's the, the raw truth. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. And just to, to I guess, give people the sort of full insight around it. You mentioned some of the dangers are shitting yourself, <laughs> um, <laughs> which may be worse than death for some people. But I mean, what, what are the extreme dangers of weight cutting or water cutting in particular? Well, again, it's when your blood starts to get acidic and starts going wrong. Yeah, we get imbalances, your kidneys start to fail. And again, quite an iconic person that we've done some very severe testing or not since it was like intrusive, but was um, Paddy Bimlet. And he went through this and the testing that was done after was like, we don't understand how this guy's kidneys are functioning mm. because it just can't process it enough. And we've got other videos of people doing more extremes. Uh, Darren Till was the name of a person who iconically was going blind whilst running on a treadmill, couldn't run anymore. And he said, just chop my body in the sauna. I can't see. And his teammates would just pick him up and put him in there and carry on. And it's like, can you not see how more people have died from weight kind than being in the physical fight? And that's the issue. And where that comes from could be crazy, a multitude of things. Like your heart rhythmic palpitations are going to be through the roof. It's not going to be doing too well. Like I said, blood work is going to go, again, just testosterone is going to be through the floor. Like everything's just going wrong. Like you're doing something your body shouldn't do. And that's that's the context behind it. But it gets kind of, not say glamorized, but because it's quite easy just to go and sweat a little bit and go, oh, my, my weight's moved. Oh, this is interesting. What should I do here? Curiosity kills the cat every time. And then it's like, oh, if I can do two, maybe I can do three. Well, maybe four, and then I do five. And then it's like, okay, well, how much is going to impact you physically as well as mentally and everything else? So I wonder what the long term ramifications are of that, of weight cutting so extreme for so long. Because I don't think we've, have we been into, like, uh, have people got into that age group yet where late, later on in life they've had any kidney problems? Well, maybe, maybe from. Yeah, maybe you know from I mean? other sports, think, perhaps. The other sports come to mind, so things like wrestling, right? right if you go yeah. to the States and judo, for example, wrestling, they've, they've got a bit more better with constraints in terms of looking after the kids because they'll wake up every weekend, right? There's no gap in between. It's not like, oh, cool, do an MMA fight, I'll fight in three months' time type thing. They'll fight every single weekend at a local wrestling school and it will then obviously potentially impact them. Now, they've put regulations in place that they have to be within a certain weight bracket or within a certain limit for them to cut that weight properly to protect the children. But I think the question would come to the original OGs, like I hate to say, like your Brock Lesnar's back in the day. Yeah, that that's what I was thinking thing. when I was there. Uh, <laughs> and just thinking, like, how did that impact them? Now, the other thing you have to consider is that are they going to be vocal about it? Because you can't change the past. Do you know what I mean? Like, do they, do they want to highlight these type of issues? I don't know. And... The other thing as well is in terms of 
gaining research for this, having willing participants to go, can I dehydrate you, please? Yeah. And then I want you to try and compete on the mat afterwards. What? Who wants to do that? No, no one. No one. So you've got to have like, there's good people out there like um, Jordy, the fight dietitian, who obviously works very closely with like, like sort of Leon Edwards, Cray Jones, all this type of stuff. Volk, obviously, to name a few. And he's done some really cool things with some of the fighters out there in Australia and New Zealand. And they've willingly trialed, let's say, a new weight bracket and seen how it's gone. Gone and done it absolutely fine, no issues. And then gone and done it actually in real life and gone and fought at the end of it. Hey, it hasn't been the outcome we've wanted. But he's in that position. He's got a good relationship to say, hey, can we trial this, guys, and see what goes from that. But to build up that community and that connection, that relationship with someone would take years, right? And it, for one thing to go wrong, they could just bin you off as a nutritionist or dietitian and be like, yeah, it didn't work, by," <laughs> And then it's game over type thing. You're never going to have to rebuild that again. I think about uh, like what one championship there. Yep. Hydration uh, testing. Yeah. What do you think about that? Do you think it should come in? Uh, so one championship hydration testing, I think is fantastic. It puts a real good emphasis on where fighters need to be. However, there's been other sports out there. Sorry, so so it's changed the question slightly that have tried to attempt this similarly. So boxing in the UK has done this as well. And they'll ask for you to do a pre, pre, pre weight in basically. Right. So the idea being is to keep the fighters within a reasonable distance of their fighting weight. And so let's say four weeks out from the fight, they'll come in and weigh them. And then from there, they're like, cool, right, you're that, you need to be X amount for away from this weight. How it's calculated, I'm not 100% sure. But basically what's happened is it's then become into two weight cuts in the space of four weeks. And they're then trying to make weight. The difference, obviously, with the hydration testing from one is that they will test their hydration levels, which is obviously fantastic. They do it before and after, don't they? They do, before and after. Uh, and also there's replications or uh, there are repercussions on their purse earnings as well, uh, which obviously as a fighter with a lot of time and effort going into it, it's obviously at that level, would it impact them as much? I don't know. But they need to, obviously, some of them will need that money. Others, maybe not as much if they went down to 50% of their purse. But... Some fighters don't care about it too much. That's the other thing I've heard of. Is it John Wayne Parr? Is it John Wayne Parr? No, one of the Muay Thai guys for one literally even wasn't even aware about it. He was like, oh, whatever, I lost my purse. Just still went on fight anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like, didn't care. He was like, I don't really care. He went and won his fight anyway off the back of it. But again, I don't know if that's Muay Thai guys for you. They're just crazy. But <laughs> who wants to throw elbows at each other willingly? Hi, not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, cool. And then I guess thinking about the actual comp day itself. So you've made weight. It's comp day. And we've had this conversation with, uh, I think Rick, we spoke to Ricky about it. Yeah. And and I, I don't know right here and now what the ADCC sort of day looks like, but a lot of comps will be very staggered throughout the day. Yep. Sometimes you'll weigh in early and you won't fight till later. Um, sometimes you'll fight in the morning and then have a massive gap fight in the afternoon. Um, so I guess just staying on with ADCC, um, and then maybe sort of more generally after that. But yeah, what does comp day nutrition typically look like? What's the best approach? And I know you're going to say it's bespoke and it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Who knew? Um, so in terms of nutrition on the day, again, I hate to say this, but it will depend right? <laughs> on the timings of your brackets. Right. And so if I was to say I've got a six hour gap, we'll just work with that to begin with maybe even eight hours, so six to eight hours you weigh and you're the last thing of the day. You're probably going to be one of the heavyweights. Again, it's just talking from my own experience here, not ADCC, but again, I'm sure you had this as well, Danny, yeah. where you're like, weighing at nine, you're not on until 7 p.m. And you're like, great, you're packing up the other mats around me. Type See, thing. I, I had um, fights in the morning at 10 and then yeah. I didn't have anything until four, I think it was. One yeah, of, so that was like, in between. Yeah. Just twiddling your thumbs, like, what do I do now? Um, so with that type of information, you would probably want to be getting up nice and early, right? Starting obviously again, sounds like so cliche. This is on some sort of fitness and so get some water down you type of thing, get hydrated ASAP, especially if you've obviously had to manipulate the following day. We want to make sure that's all replenished, right? We then want to make sure of like high carb, high fat meals. So anything that comes to mind is going to be things like oats with eggs or like poached eggs and salmon or the toast, that type of thing. Um, and the idea being is we want as much carbohydrate in there, but with a good fat content in there that far out to slow the digestion down so that it will just basically last a lot longer across the day type of thing. So that'll be quite good. So things that come to mind, oats and uh, banana with peanut butter, for example, which is just a combination that comes to mind. Want a big bowl of that, making sure again, we are used to that volume of food and we've got no di uh, digestion or gut uh, in, um, upset type of thing. Uh, and then from there, we then look to then obviously probably have another meal two hours later. 
uh, which again would consist of quite balanced altogether. So carb, fat, protein, probably not as much fat as we start to come down closer to, closer to the time because we want more immediate hits. Uh, and again, from there, more hydration, more topping up, keeping on top of it. And again, supposing obviously weights will be made and stuff, we just keep repeating that process until we get closer to the time of competition where we're looking at potentially like the final hour is when we probably change the carb group, sorry, the groups to more carb, high carb focused mm-hmm. uh, or high GI carb focused as well. And then look to just keep on topping up. And then in between matches, we want to be there having some, again, leukocyte sports, stuff like that. There's some supplementation that I'd probably suggest to do as well. And so again, dependent on the individual and what you have tested and what it's willing to do so so caffeine induction obviously is going to be useful in terms of that uh, one thing i've been working on at the moment is caffeine from chewing gum being a little bit more superior than from digesting it from drinks such as monster or something like this uh, generally because when we look at the digestion times of things going through our mouth it's more immediate sort of 10 to 15 minute bracket compared to something like uh, again energy drink like monster or red bull taking about 46 to 40 to 60 minutes to be in our system um, so you could look to time that well in between rounds as well. And then again, it's kind of like, right, just keep topping up carbohydrates. And again, it's more specific numbers based on the individual. So you can look at sort of 30 grams of carbs per obviously per kilo of body weight. And obviously you can start to go up depending on how big the individual is. But again, you want this more personalized to you in terms of what you can handle and what's obviously most best for you. When it comes to competition day, let's obviously, if I bring it down, actually like the hobbyist, we say outside of ADCC, we need to just get you to consume food, right? There's some people on the day that I've worked with who say that they just can't eat, right? Don't want to eat, <laughs> nervous. really, really nervous, that type of stuff. And so that's when we want to start utilizing other food groups that are going to be easy to get on board. And so I always refer to people as like, look at what babe, newborn babies are like. Do they start on solid food straight away? No. Does it mean they have no energy? No, of course they do. They've got loads of energy. The idea being is we just start on liquids, Right work our way up to liquids onto pulps once we get comfortable with that. If we can go from pulp foods to a bit more like solid foods, firm gray, if we can get onto the fully solid foods, then fantastic. And that also requires a bit of like training and sort of getting used to, I call it gut training, but I don't want to get confused with like gut microbiomes and stuff like that. So that's a completely different kettle of fish. But again, building that confidence up to do that and that will only happen over time. But if you're really struggling on the day, go down the liquid route. It's just going to be a lot more easier just to get on board. Um, and that could come in like smoothies, that could come in like orange juices, anything like that. Lucasade sport, again, I'm not endorsed by Lucasade, I promise. Um, but it's just, again, I guess that's my point. You see all the Olympic athletes walking around with it all the time. It's a really good base drink type of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's good, man. It's good advice. Thank you. And I was just interested because you mentioned, we, we've touched on it already about sort of coaches doing the weight cuts in and giving the nutrition advice and that type of thing. As a nutritionist working with athletes, do you ever get much pushback from skills coaches or jiu-jitsu coaches yep it has happened before i think the one thing that i've learned from it so i've been burnt by it several times right um the idea being is that we need to be as open about the communication as possible right i think from other professionals out there who may be listening to this unfortunately it's not always going to go the way that you think it is there are some people in this world who are stuck in their ways are or quite money driven and that's what they want to do is make sure they're not losing out on any money and then regardless of what attempt you do it's just gonna be the case of i know better shut up go away right however there's a good handful of coaches or a good majority of coaches who are open-minded to say right i'm an expert in this area let's look then obviously to get someone on board like myself or an snc person or a physio or whatever to then help optimize their athletes that much more better um, and then from there, it gives them less stress to worry about, if I'm honest. And that's the that's the biggest thing that I think is hard from other skills coaches to understand is that I'm not here to step on your toes. I'm actually here to make your life easier, right? If Don't get me wrong. If I'm awful at my job, I'm giving you more of a headache than fine. I get that completely. But it gives you less stress to worry about, right? And if it's a case that you're concerned on losing out on money, if I'm honest, then advertise that you do the bloody thing, Yeah and charge separately for it. Don't necessarily be like, well, I do everything type of thing. I'm like, well, if I needed my, I don't know, my toilet fixing, right? My electrician isn't kicking off that I'm calling a plumber, right? Just because you can just, you can feel like you can do anything type of thing. It's like, well, advertise that you, you, you deal with that type of stuff, right? Um, but yeah, there is some pushback. It's not always the case. I'm not going to stereotype and say it's what old school coaches that are like this, but there'd probably even be new school coaches that, I don't know, cult like let's put it like that who don't want anyone interfering with their school or something like this that don't want to have it there but um take the stress away from is what i try to say like you guys have become a black belt in the sport that you're in or whatever belt it may be or profession that you may be you're not going to be a black belt in everything i'm going to say like i'm no black belt in jiu-jitsu i can categorically say that 
nutrition. I'm a bit uh, reserved. I would say my black belt nutrition is always stuff for me to be learning. And that, again, it obviously comes up to a very good point. If you come across someone who thinks they know everything, just massive red flag straight away. <laughs> yeah. Like instantaneously, I'll be happy to hold my hands up at any point and say, if I don't know something, can I get back to you? Let me just look over some research. And then I would fall back on my research as a scientist to say, look, okay, I need to look at these studies, assess these studies. Because again, nowadays, anyone can go on PubMed and type in, I don't know, why is the carnivore diet better than veganism, right? And you'll probably get some studies up there about it type of thing that will, be favor you, that will favor you. And likewise, if I did veganism versus carnival, there'll be studies that will favor that argument as well. So it's more than just, here's a study, that's it, gospel. You've got to go through that study. Was there a big testing pool? What was it done on? What was the actual testing procedure like? I mean, narrative to, to, to the test and who's actually fucking paying for the test. Yeah, again. and that's, that's the other tricky part is that, again, I, I suppose what I said is someone else, like getting funding for those three bits of research, right? Very few philanthropists out there, I can't remember if I said that well, I thought it was going to that, um, are going to pay for research just off the cuff as, unless they have a kind of interest off of it. But likewise, we're not going to get government funding for things. Like they're, they're not, no one's going to go like, I really fancy just seeing 20 guys just suffer for a 10 kilogram weight cut just for the sake of it type of thing. Like, no, unless they're just sick and twisted in some sort of way. It's never going to be the case. Um, but you then got to go for that research and pick through, as I kind of mentioned, and Danny sort of picked up on is there, is there is any bias to this? And then make a, eventually a kind of a pop my head above the parapet, parapet decision and kind of say, right, this is legitimate type of thing. And unfortunately in the world of jujitsu that we're in, it's very small. Um, it's scary to say, and I've said this on other podcasts and other nutritionists and dietitians have agreed with me that I'm sometimes, sometimes relying on like two studies. And if people then push past that and go, well, I don't believe this one, I don't believe this one, I've got nothing else to go off of that's related specifically to this sport, if that makes sense. So it's a bit um, a bit scary in places, to mm -hmm. say the least. Yeah, no, mate, it's definitely a bit of the Wild West out there for sure. And in a, in one other thing I wanted to talk to you about as well, so we've obviously talked about weight cutting and, and some of the dangers around that and some of the fucking cowboy coaches that try and muscle in on nutrition stuff. So another area um, within jiu-jitsu is obviously steroids. It's the secret juice, but not so secret these days because it feels like it's, obviously with Gordon Ryan, it seems like it's, it's kind of opened up recently, isn't it? I think it. there's always been speculation. I think anybody who knows anything about how the body works and physiology can probably have a good guess. But it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty much amazing now. So it's, it's become quite apparent that certainly within some federations and some competitions, it is unregulated, as we kind of touched on it earlier. What are your thoughts on like steroids? Is it is it something, do you tend to work with people that are on steroids? So I don't necessarily zone in for people who are just on, on steroids, we say, um, but we've worked with clients who are natural, uh, clients who have gone from natural to enhanced, uh, some that are, are enhanced and then want to become natural and vice versa. And I think where I've got an additional nutrition consultancy, it's not just on jujitsu athletes. And obviously I've been around the scene for quite some time. I've seen similar trends in other fields, if that makes sense. So I'll take an example and just talk about the bodybuilding world just for a second, right? And I always look at this one moment, which I think was earlier uh, earlier last year on the Olympia page. They had Phil Heath talking about his steroid cycle before competing on the stage. Now, if we took this back five years ago, there would be no mention of such a thing, right? Because again, it's this deep, dark secret that people knew about but didn't know exactly what it was about. And it only took the time, obviously, for a few, if you want to call them influencers, who would talk a little bit more openly about it to the point now that people joke about it and this type of stuff. And this argument is like, are you still natural if you're on TRT, for example, right? Um, but it's then come a little bit more spoken about. Now, I ended up doing my uh, dissertation on steroid usage and the idea of being about how open people are with their doctors and their usage and this was in particular with bodybuilders and so which was a high percentage said that i think it was like 96 percent of both male and female said they wouldn't speak to their doctor about it because they felt unconfident they knew what they're dealing with now speaking to doctors as well they said they're not trained in it unless they specialize in endocrinology they they've, they're not aware of it right and in the case of the messages don't do it right and so as of anything i could tell people don't do heroin right? If you've got a heroin addict, it doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, sorry, I didn't realize that, my bad, and I'm going to suddenly stop, right? And so, as of anything, it's kind of mitigating the circumstances that can come with it or the errors that can come with it. And again, with an unre unregulated industry, because again, getting access to these type of tools is not as if it's the dark web and we've got to use cryptocurrency to buy this stuff. Pop into any local gym in the UK, there'll be some, go and find the biggest guy there with the most veinous forehead, probably, or something like this, and then he'll probably know someone, right? Not to, not to endorse it, but 
they will then come across it. And then it's the idea of being like, all right, well, what, what do I do with this? Right? Do I just simply just take this tablet? Do I inject this stuff into me? Uh, and then what are the repercussions from this? And the majority of the time we look at the positives, like a gambler, we're always up. We're never, never really down at all in the slightest bit. And then, great, cool, that's absolutely fine. And then there's no afterthought of what happens after or what happens if I run out? Do I carry on going for the rest of my life? And so my kind of stance on it is I want more education, a little bit more openness about it. And I think the jiu-jitsu scene is starting to openly talk about it. Unfortunately, it's started on a more glamorous trend of like, hey, I'm openly on steroids as Gordon Ryan, I'm nice and juicy, I don't care type thing. Um, and the other thing to put into context is this is coming from a guy who's based in the States where they've got more private healthcare accessibility to do these such of things, right? You walk into your local GP practice nowadays and say, hey, I'll get some blood work done. They go, sorry, what? Uh, why? Like, you ill? No, I just want to do TRT or something like this. So I, no, right? You've got to go privately or you've got to go and pay for an individual sort of blood check group like um, MediCheck, Optimail, lots of different ones out there who obviously do that. Um, and again, you've also got to go through the, the rigmarole of figuring out which test to pick, right? There's not, there's, there's hundreds of tests you can do. And you're there like, okay, well, how in depth do I go, right? Average guy might go, oh, shit, my testosterone levels, right? That's like 25 pounds to do that. Like little fingerprint test will come through, absolutely no problem. Doesn't tell you anything about your free testosterone. Yeah, it doesn't tell you about your other hormones that get affected, like your estrogen and this type of stuff. And so it's a massive minefield. And I think it just needs to be more openly talked about. If you want to do it, it's then about doing it safe, it's the safest way. And so if I have any clients that come to me or are thinking or considering it, it's like, right, well, we're going to get your blood work done to begin with. And I think the scary thing about that as well is that people who've had their blood work done don't even know what they're looking at. They go, I think I'm low. And I've seen people's blood work profile. And this is to say, I'm not an endocrinologist. This is just me looking at numbers and where they are type of thing. Most guys should be, I think, somewhere between oh, nine, nine minimal to, I think, up to 30 minimal or 29. Yeah. And so, again, I've had some guys come to me before and said, oh, I'm 18. A bit low, isn't it? I'm like, no, that's like bang average. Right. But because it's not 29, it's low. And I'm like, right, okay, well, that's not the end of the world in terms of that. I mean, like, just because you felt tired one day because you did two jiu-jitsu sessions and one day doesn't mean that all of a sudden you need, you need TRT, right? Other health markers come back fine. So again, sorry, back to my point of if you're going to do these type of things, start with a basic blood work panel, opt in on some of these services to get an endocrinologist or doctor to check over these type of markers and see what's going on. Uh, and then obviously from there, it's down to you. You're, you're an adult. Make the decision, obviously, on what needs to be done. And then look to repeat the blood work, obviously, towards the end. I think there certainly is going to be a lot more education on post-course treatment, okay, in terms of if you're going to cycle this type of stuff, then we need to rebalance all of your other hormones after coming off of it. And if you're staying on permanent TRT, it's then obviously, again, taking considerations of things like fertility um, for the future, again, Young guys out there getting obviously glamorized by Gordon to some degree and then kind of saying, oh, I'm going to get on the juice. This is absolutely fantastic. And they're like 22, let's say, right? Um, they could be even slightly older. They could be in their late 20s, right? And I'm like, okay, have you got any consideration for kids right now? And they're like, no. Like, why would I be thinking about kids? I'm like, well, you've got a message. You've been with her. You're engaged, this type of thing, right? You doing this TRT dosage could then stop that from happening. And they're like, seriously? Like, and I'm like, yeah, and I don't want to have thought of that. And I'm like, so many people don't even research it. Do they? No. So many. And, and that's the problem is, again, because it's kind of got this dark facade around it or, or like this deep, dark secret, we don't talk about it, that unfortunately that people aren't, it's not readily available in terms of all that research either. And then likewise, if we look, again, not to put my tin hat on too much here, but we look at like general NHS sort of measurements, it's like you're going to have X, Y, and Z symptoms guaranteed, that's it type thing. And it becomes even more sort of, glorified as like this horrible nasty thing and you just shouldn't do end of conversation and it's like well there's more people i think we've got more issues with steroid use now in the uk than there's ever been and like in across the whole of the nation and i think it's because again it's, it's, it's kind of safe sex talk that we're just not talking about it enough and i think giving support to members in environments where again it's not tested and we're not in a tested sport so the whole argument of cheating is kind of out of the window it's only based on people's personal beliefs that if they go and enter their local sort of like jujitsu competition they're taking testosterone at higher levels than what we need to do no one cares no one's testing like what difference does it make is that that's their opinion right they could have trained maybe five times a day and had all the pcs in the world do you know what i mean does that make it unfair on the other people not at all so i think 
to answer your question again sort of doing it safely is probably my biggest sort of statement with this and that probably the biggest statement that i probably say is that is you need a, if you're considering of really going enhanced with this the words pds obviously start with performance if there's no performance to enhance in the first place then you're just there's nothing to do with it you just don't shouldn't even consider it right it comes to another point want to be an athlete your nutrition should be checked should be getting appropriate sleep if possible based on structure, right? Training structure should be there. If you're turning up to the gym twice a week and that's a push, right? Don't give a fuck about what you're eating, barely getting any sleep, boozing on the weekend, grabbing some bag, whatever type thing, yeah? You then enhancing yourself on top of it isn't gonna outweigh the rest of it, yeah? And that's where, like I said, performance enhancing drugs, you need a performance first to enhance. And if that performance is not there, then it's a pointless drug to be taking. So. I'd like Gordon to come out and just say what compounds he's actually taking because that's another thing because yeah. this the array of different things we're talking about testosterone yeah but that's that's, that's 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 the that's the baseline oh, for most God, people, yeah. especially in the bodybuilding world or whatever you know when you go prima bowling and you know you got anavar the oro then you got trend diana ball and you know you got all these different things and and i know lads even when i you know when i was lifting regularly you know in their 20s and they would just be like right i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna 400 milligrams a week of uh testosterone and then i'm gonna stack that with some prima bolin and then i'm gonna phase that out and go on six weeks of trend yes and then get some eq in there to get the food up because they'll just they'll just go on a forum and my my worry especially with jujitsu is that maybe maybe not to the extremes of that but more so just if they are going to do enhancements like just fucking do test if they're just going to do something do test don't go down the fucking trend you know those real harsh compounds that will just fuck up their hearts and their insides and you know that their, their hormones will never return <laughs> they'll, they'll never get back to a baseline after you fucking stay on trend for too long but i just wonder the reason i say about gordon coming out and saying what he's on is just literally maybe to save some fucking lives with people like taking shit you know and then the after effects of like their mental health because that's what people don't remember as well it's like you go on testosterone as a young lad they go on it for three months. They get jacked. They win a competition, whatever. They come off it. They don't realize that they've become fucking depressed because they got no testosterone anymore. You know, you can you can do one cycle and never get testosterone again. Some people are lucky; it comes back naturally. They don't even sometimes have to do a cycle after to to get to get their hormone levels back. Some people are quite lucky with that. Some people are not. But people don't understand that they need to do that to to be able to go back to normal. And then that then the mental health side of it comes in. They feel weaker. They're they're, they're depressed. They're fucking not eating right, all those different types of things. That there's just no there's no education to, to be able to say to people like go and do this, go and do that. And that's that's the issue you got. This it, it comes back to like I said, seeing these other industries such as like the bodybuilding world and going through it all, right? And I, I still say to this day, it really boggles me that for a sport which is probably way more older than any other sport out there, right? It seems to have only found social media in the last sort of three years. Right, and is now talking about this type of stuff, and it's just behind for some reason. And so, we look at as you mentioned all these other compounds and stuff like that. That's obviously the phase one is people talking about it a little bit more. Phase two is then talking about people's body dysmorphia that then comes into it. Right, people then talk about mental health. Right, we then look at let's say modern day bodybuilding. I think obviously in the last year or so, the amount of bodybuilders who've been dying and passing away, and like it's been yeah, those guys crazy. like. I've known locally, not personally, but of like a guy called Neil Curry, who I think he was, he was just known for having ginormous fucking quads, right? His aspirations was to become a pro, right? Which is fantastic. That's really, really good. But again, all of a sudden, just overnight, disappeared. And it's just like, oh, wow, okay. Any talk of it? No, 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 just just health problems. You're like, well, hold on. These guys are supposed to be the epitome of health, like in this sort of position. And then you've got athletes like Gordon who are looking in that same sort of physique and everything. All right, they're performing obviously to that, which is fantastic. But then, as to what detriment, and so we all do it. You look at where Diana Bolt started; it was to help with burns victims, right, and to help with their skin recovery. Um, obviously, from this, uh, then curiosity came into play, and they decided, well, "What happens if we put this Diana Bolt on a normal human being, right, and just see all this?" And this is in the oral form, right? Absolutely fine, interesting. All these athletes. Next, you know, one of them just dropped dead. What happened? The guy took twenty times the amount it was supposed to daily and it was just like oh okay right that's fine and again no information no understanding of this and that's something that will happen i'm not saying that anyone who takes steroids is going to have exactly the same outcome of it but there's just so many other things that come along with it do you ever hear of anyone taking like clenbuterol or anything like that yeah loads of times um, yeah. i'm honest and the, 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 again <laughs> the irony behind that is the amount of lads who have taken clen let's say ready for their ibifa trip 
right? To get absolutely shredded or wherever it may be, Marbella, whatever it could be, to then all of a sudden then come off of it, then go and take some bag on their holiday type of thing and go, so your heart rate's gone from up here to come off it all of a sudden, then chuck it back up here. I wonder how well your heart's like feeling right now type of thing. Yeah, chucking the alcohol, chucking everything else on top of it. You're just like, Jesus Christ, what's going on? But uh, Clembutrol in jiu-jitsu, I've not, I know of people who do jiu-jitsu and take it, but I wouldn't say it's in like top-end competitors to make weight and stuff, I wouldn't say. Um, again, I just don't see, this is where the novelty side of jiu-jitsu is at the moment. I think we're still, there'll be some individuals within the bodybuilding scene who cross over into jiu-jitsu because they'll support and being yeah. there, being like, I'm sure you guys have got it in terms of like bodybuilders saying they're S&C coaches. It's like, well, no, you you teaching someone to do a bicep curl is not S&C. Like, do you know what I mean? Like there's levels to this. And I think that's where that crossover will come in. I've had it with athletes before who said like, this bodybuilder guy, he's like, help me do like a little circuit type thing. He said, oh, why am I not taking ephedrine or something like this? <laughs> and I'm like, you can't take ephedrine, you're tested. And he was like, really? I'm like, yeah, you, it's not legal, right? They're like, oh, okay, but how come he can take, he's a bodybuilder, right? That's the difference. And again, they have no understanding of it. But again, talking from personal experience, but you get pally with these people who can get supplies, this type of thing, they'll recommend anything to you, right? Oh, yeah, you need to get shredded, take some trend. Yeah, when I was like 19, <laughs> I wanted to uh, cut a bit of weight. And um, the, the local gym I went to with my uncle, he, they give me EPH 25 plus, which is <laughs> ephedrine, <laughs> aspirin, aspirin yeah. and um, caffeine oh, I and a tablet. Stack. Yeah, right. Yeah. So they give me that and I was like taking two in the morning, two in the afternoon, fucking off my nut. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was like, oh, yeah, could run for hours. Like no, it was it was good, but I didn't realise. So I was taking this for like two months and like lost a load of weight and was like, fucking hell, this is good. And then when I was trying to come off it, it was like struggling to come off it a little bit because I didn't feel as good off it, you know? And then when I was like looking at the bottle, I was like, oh, what, what actually's in it because i was i was taking it for two months at like 18 <laughs> yeah. not knowing what was fucking in it yeah. because i was trust it's own shit but you when you're especially at that age when you're young you trust a 40 year old man who's giving you some fat bonus that's the point of the black belt above you that's it like, yeah like you, in terms of advice, like, i did you know I, mean? I, like, I i trusted him that you know that he would have given me something that wasn't going to fucking kill me you know what yeah. i mean and then taking those tablets but yeah and then i, I fucking read up on it and i was like fuck I'm going to die. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to fucking die. I remember there were certain pre-workouts back in the day. Obviously, I know we've obviously probably all talked about Jack 3D back in the day type of thing, like knocking off your rocker. There's another one that was around about five years ago called Mango Missile, right? <laughs> no <laughs> word of a lie. Like, your dick wasn't working after it. It was that, like, that. You were just doing, like, Fuck, what's going on? And then you'd have, like, a come down afterwards. You're like, Jesus Christ, what the fuck's in this type of thing? But it was just, yeah, it's... You get roped into that environment and how much we talk about we're kind of all anti-cult type of thing. Until you step out of it, you just don't even realize it. And it took me a good couple of years out of the bodybuilding industry and go like, how weird is these guys and girls all want to get really bronzed up and just stand in their pants in front of people, right? And don't get me wrong, same thing with jiu-jitsu. You guys want to get really sweaty and just cuddle each other and think it's fun to try and like strangle each other. Like, so you get out of it and you look at it you're like, that's really fucking weird but you're engrossed in it and believe it through and through and then like you're just like oh my god what the hell is with this type of thing and you, you make you normalize in your head do you know what i mean yeah i completely agree yeah it's gonna be a funny one i think going back to your comments about gordon being open i think at the moment it's one of his dark secrets isn't it it's like in the old days when you used to have the, the gyms that were really closed off and, and, and wouldn't allow anybody else to understand what they're doing but i think it, it might like you said earlier go the, the same way as the ufc did where if it does get to a level of, of sponsorship and and sort of publicity and everything else and, and does become clean that's where like you saw in the ufc where you'll see certain athletes when we've just r.i.p uberim <laughs> yeah <laughs> suddenly just fucking just it's true, though, gordon if he had to come off everything now well you've seen when he got ill what his physique changed into you know someone if if nicky rod is as legit as he's saying he is if he is then he'd fucking smash Gordon. And the people go, oh no, you know, technically better, whatever. But I'm all about physically, physically, you know, if Gordon goes to where he was when he was ill, you may not go back that, that far back. But if he's taking these harsh compounds, there's no way back from that. You know, if he's taking Tren or if he's taking this or that, there's no way back from that. Um, yeah, there's just, there's just no way back from that. And if there's no way back from it, like... Yeah, I think only then, if that ever happened and then he was out of the sport and out competing, that's where, that's when he might be open and honest about it. Yeah, he wouldn't be able to compete though. As in, if he, if he had to go, if they went legit now and they said, you know, no drugs and ADCC, no drugs, he wouldn't be able to, because he wouldn't be able to compete 
we're on nothing because you'd have to take as a baseline TRT. You saw it with Charles Sonnen, didn't you? He pretty much retired from the UFC because he couldn't take TRT and basically yeah. fucked. Yeah. So it was like, well, I need, I need it. So I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, lads. Thanks. <laughs> it's, it's been, been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. 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 That's it, the people's champ. Um, it's interesting to say because I, I don't think I don't think ADCC would ever ban it. I think they've got too much financial backing from so quite big, obviously wealthy people, obviously from where it obviously come back from, Abu Dhabi Combat Club, right? Anything that's involved with Middle East, if I'm honest, is not normally short of a penny, right? Um, and so you look at the numbers of what he draws, and I think it's a very common theme that people have spoken about publicly that any flow matches, Gordon's not on there, they tank numbers numbers tank every single time regardless of who they it's bring out say that. most of the time Gordon's on a watch it if it's not don't bother don't going. bother yeah. alright and it's just the case then again with ADCC right I think Gordon's bigger problem with his steroids usage is that he's running out of opponents mm. right and that's the big problems and this is what John Jones had back in the day is that he defeated everyone in like heavyweight division and was like, well, what else do I do now? I'll just party for the time being. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll put myself at a detriment. I, I've kind of joked. I think if I wanted to see like, pr- like the, not the best Gordon Rice, it'd be a bit, a bit count- counterintuitive, but Gordon being challenged, I want to see him natty, fat as fuck, right? And, like <laughs> having to fight someone like Nicky Rod on him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. it'd be the classical, like, I don't know, masters five, like black belt who just like has two kids and like his full-time job type of thing. And he's like overweight, trying to take on the athletic blue belt. Who's like, yeah, let's fucking go. Type yeah, thing. no, that's probably right? it. Though, that's it? that's yeah. the closest you ever get of like an interesting match. But outside of that, like- Cause there's no denying that Gordon's the best technically. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like he's f- so fucking good. You take away his physique, he's still fucking unbelievable. Even John Banner you know I mean? said it. Like John said that he's no, he knows better more than him in some aspects. And it's just like, you've now got to a point where you've got no other people that you've not beaten already. The only obvious ones, obviously, are Nicholas, Nicholas Marigali, right? They train together now, don't they? They do train together, right? And then on top of it as well, it's like, okay, he's the gee guy, I'm the no gi guy. If they're, if they're collaborative, which it would not surprise me in the slightest bit about it, that they would just keep that going. I'm the king of the gi, I'm the king of the no gi, and they just wouldn't cross that line. But Marigali, though, he's just beat pe- uh, Penna, hasn't he? Yeah. So that that causes a fucking issue then. It depends if that line's been discussed. You know what I mean? Like, you dominate the gi scene, I'll dominate the It must be hard, though, if they so. train together, and Gordon, you know, you don't know what goes on in the training room, but if Gordon's fucking battering him in the training room, it's like... Phew. It's hard. It's really so tricky. hard, isn't it? I don't know where to go with, like, Gordon, because, again, like, I think where he grew big in size, physical size, too quickly... He could have, dare I say it, like worked his way up the roster, right? Let's say he wasn't like the ultra heavyweight that he is today and he was smaller. And like to prove a point, it's like, all right, I've got every gold at every way at ADCC, right? And then this is my final outing at ultra and I'm done. Like, fine, can't see it. The only reason he got big was he was concerned with the size that he had issues with Penner back in the yeah. day. And obviously Galval getting big as well. And yeah, so, Galval's a fucking monster. Well, and he's a monster. <laughs> again, I, I like Galval. Like, again, I'd love to see like Natty or not type pictures. So, like when he's like before competition. <laughs> nah, you're not. Like, before, <laughs> before competition season in like ADCC, he's like, chewing, like this. Chewing trend, is. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, mate, it's, yeah, it's a fucking, it's a mad scene, isn't it? Speaking of uh, pinning up, mate, you couldn't have noticed that when you arrived, you stuck a little needle in, your, in yourself, mate. Are you on the old juicy juice? Nah, well, I'll leave that up to everyone's, <laughs> everyone's imagination. But um, I do you know, I'll be open about this. I've definitely taken stuff previously, right? Obviously, again, when you're friends with a, with a dealer of some sort, he ends up recommending absolutely everything to you. I think the other day I was thinking about, uh, was it uh, something called One Rip, which was a mixture of prop mass and trend, I think it was, all together. Yeah, my mate, my mate used to take that. <laughs> he got fucking massive. <laughs> and so, again, this was at the days of like doing bodybuilding and stuff like this. And so, had aspirations of becoming a Miami pro athlete, which was not based in Miami at all. It was just based in somewhere in Bristol or London <laughs> like this, which is hilarious. Um, and yeah, as I kind of alluded to earlier, you just get involved in this sort of culture of stuff and everything. After doing everything quite silly and taking a lot of different stuff, like again, it's about getting into, I definitely wasn't like touching anything like growth or insulin or anything like that, which is like the top end of it, which again, to this world, I don't understand why every jiu jitsu athlete thinks about starting on that. It's like beyond me. What growth? Man, people go, I'm really? going to start on the growth. I'm like, sorry? 250 like, quid a month and yeah. fucking have to jab it into your stomach. And that's even like you said, like if you want good quality stuff, I've heard people like taking, like selling off like brand new like cars and stuff like this just to try and supply for the whole year. And I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. Like you're talking like the best of the best stuff, like type of thing. Um, and like, again, I always use this example, like Messi's career to this day from football wouldn't be where it is if, if Barcelona didn't fund his human growth hormone because he was stunted as a child. And so... They paid for him to have that growth hormone so they'd help with, I think it was the femur bones within his legs to be able to do that, which is why he's notoriously small now. 
Um, but again, complete sidetrack there. Took everything bar that basically. Um, came back off of it, and then I was like, right, okay. So again, that was the first time I experienced like low mood, like low libido, that type of stuff. And then uh, had an online coach who also went went publicly about taking stuff, and I thought, oh, okay, fine. He's gone from natural to then doing all this type of stuff. I feel quite interested in this guy to do it. Uh, and he said, all right, well, we can start on testosterone, but we're also going to look at every other sort of health marker you've got, like your blood sugar levels as well. I was like, okay, fine. So obviously I wanted to put on size at the time. So eating a lot of food, I want to make sure our insulin sensitivity is there. So started doing this process, started just taking just testosterone along, obviously, I think with some tamoxifen, I think it was, um, just to keep, obviously, some estrogen levels down, that type of thing. Um, and when I was doing the blood sugar markers randomly, they were coming up really quite high. Right, and so for anyone not listening, obviously with blood sugar markers, you want your levels between anywhere between sort of five and ten, yeah, at a push. These were coming in at like 15, 23, 32 some days. Fucking, I had no idea at the time. Again, completely delusional to this. Now, at the time I was doing my nutrition degree, I was again learning about these modules and stuff like this, and it was like when you're doing your nutrition module uh, or any sort of modules within sort of health and well-being within any university, a lot of the lectures will start by saying that we're going to tell you, we're going to talk to you about a subject. Yeah. You probably don't have the symptoms, but just out of coincidence, you might start thinking you do have them type of thing. And they're going, right. Okay. So for type one cases, really dry mouth. Right, 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 tick. Here we go. I've got one of them. Oh, uh, constant urination, like all the time. I'm like, well, yeah, I've always popped out this lecture like three times when really, you're like 15 minutes in type of thing. Um, really struggling with like headaches, cloudiness, all this type of stuff. I'm like, well, this seems really severe. Now, I'm already taking these like health markers in terms of like checking my blood sugar levels. I'm like, why is this high? Online coach at the time was sort of saying, hmm, might want to go speak to a doctor about this. This doesn't seem particularly normal. And I'm like, right, spoke to the doctor, started the testing of it. Fast forward a few weeks later, uh, had a car crash on the way back from locking up my mate's gym who obviously previously pumped me first <laughs> steroids and stuff but again I was pally with him at the time so helping him out there here and there just an independent gym a uh, bit of a hit and run incident and I was like oh Jesus Christ what's happened there car was completely written off but everything fine uh, and everything sorted however symptoms of like dry mouth constant urination wanting to go to sleep all the time went through the roof because I wasn't training all of a sudden right elements of whiplash in there so obviously they told me not to train that type of stuff I was like right okay Went to the doctors and then said about my HB1AC, which is basically a marker to see where your blood sugars are over like the sort of 90 days. And they said, you're supposed to be anywhere between naturally between like 45 and 52. You're currently sat at like 178. <laughs> Fucking hell. And I was like, uh, sorry? And I, at that time, I'd learned more in my modules about this. So I was like, Jesus fucking Christ, like what, what's going on now? My wife was with me at the time and she was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? I was like, that shouldn't be anywhere near like this type of thing. They're like, have you been like finger pricking yourself and like understanding your sugar levels? And I was like, no. Oh, sorry, I said, yes, I have been because obviously I've been doing this because again, there was a bit of a murky waters of some of these doctors and GPs saying like, why are you taking testosterone? Like, and I'm like, I want to be a bodybuilder. This is what I want to do. And again, I could see from my dissertation like where that relationship had just like broken down because I'm like, you're just saying, just don't do it. You're not supporting it anymore. So I've already spoken to about this and they're like, oh, okay, well, are you taking any growth hormone? Are you taking anything like this? Trying to obviously try and understand it. And I was quite open about everything with it and they said, fine. Uh, basically concluded with me testing me having type 1 diabetes and that um, I had a problem obviously where I wasn't producing the right cells due to the autoimmune disease uh, and so then became insulin dependent. One of the things they did say is a potential consideration is that the testosterone caused it. Um, or the potential previous steroid use. Now, when you go through that list on the NHS website of like potential side effects of these type of things, it's on there. Did I pay attention to it? No, I'm not type one. I don't eat donuts until I come out of my ears type of thing. That's not going to bother me. That then happened. And then, so yeah, as my wife likes to put, <laughs> say a lot of the times, like, oh, look, you wanted to get big and stab yourself with needles and all this type of stuff. Now you've got to do it for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm like, cheers, thank you for that. That's really yeah. what I need here. Um, so yeah, now I have type one diabetes. Uh, I've been managing it now for probably three to four years. I got it quite late into my life, so 28, I got it. Mm, that's it really rare though, isn't it? It is, yeah. It they is. used to call it childhood diabetes, didn't they? Because it, it, the onset's normally in childhood. Yeah. And I think you, you just touched it then, but just to clear up for the listeners that type one is, is like you said, it's an autoimmune condition where the cells get destroyed so you don't produce insulin. Yeah, I don't produce any insulin at all. So let's say all of us on the table sat here and had a donut all of a sudden. I presume you guys aren't type one, but again, like the idea behind is that you would then produce insulin to break down that glucose, glucose molecule, molecules within the bloodstream uh, to obviously help with that. Now, myself, wouldn't my pancreas has just stopped altogether. 
Um, now, when you're kind of going through that process, you then obviously require an insulin to obviously help manage it. There's different types of insulin, being like slow acting, fast acting, and some other stuff in between. Um, but it's not as straightforward <laughs> as uh, just take it with food. There's other things that can implement it, be that illness, be that tiredness, be that adrenaline. Competition days are a fucking nightmare for me, to say the least, type of thing. And there's adverse effects from not having too, uh, from having like high sugar levels to also having low sugar levels as well. So, um, yeah, pretty, pretty <laughs> unique situation to deal with type of thing. And also being within a sport, which is very unique as well in jujitsu, trying to find people who've also got type one and then do jujitsu as well. I think I've, I've come across on social media, like two pages and both of them are based in the States type of thing. Outside of that, it's like, no, we don't deal with this type of thing. So it's so interesting though, isn't it? With the steroid use and then you get it because how many people, do, uh, how, how old was you when you got it? 28 it's really it's like unheard of but that's the thing so in my head when i was in the world of that bodybuilding i was like oh, i'm just taking tests it's nothing yeah. like i've taken trend i've taken everything else it's, it's nothing it's definitely not a test like people do this for trt dosage, which is what i'm telling myself right i was like maybe it was a car crash onset stress, stress causes some g mutation and then obviously led to it my family do have some autoimmune disease but no one had type one so I was like, okay, fine. And then obviously from there- You'll never know, but you can look at factors, lifestyle factors. That's all it is, isn't it? Exactly. Look at lifestyle factors. And, and again, lifestyle factors in consideration was like, all right, yeah, maybe I was, again, for what I was doing whilst I was bodybuilding, which is putting on size, would be more replicable of what type two would have caused in terms of like really like, like poor insulin sensitivity yeah. because of the amount of food I was consuming. But at the same time, it's like, it didn't go to type two, it went to type one. And yeah, so it's just... like- there's not like a boundary of like, oh, you push it past further, you're coming to type one type of thing. Yeah. It's just, that's a disease. And so now I'm having to, again, <laughs> slightly delayed for this podcast, rushing in because I left my insulin pen at home type of thing. I us do a quick U-turn. Um, but now, yeah, we have to, I have to medicate all the time with it. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's, I try my not to let it hold me back either too much because I don't want to live my life normally. But then likewise, I think this is where my passion for the steroid tour comes in a little bit more in the sense that not to say woe is me like don't do steroids you're guaranteed type one but it's one of those things which as guys you can read through those symptoms this and go ah, well, whatever don't really give a fuck about it it's fine no worries i just want to get jacked and juicy and then not think about having to as my wife says having to stab yourself with needles for the rest of your life type of thing i think the other thing as well is when you're taking steroids from fucking whoever from the gym you don't even know what's in that bottle that's the big thing as well like they've done tests on like testosterone and the amount of time that testosterone had fucking three or four other small amounts of compounds in it where they were just in a fucking lab chucking it all together whatever and it's so uh, they you test all those vials mate. There's, there's not just testosterone in them you know at least if you do what you say go to and get trt from a doctor if you go private at least you know when you're getting that vial and you're sticking it in your arm it's all testosterone but that's there's a funny story i've got with that because at the gym i my mate obviously wanted to set up his own private gym that type of stuff wanted help with it he was a dealer at the time as well and um and obviously was very well known within the air because he had a lot of people come in all that type of stuff right he, I was probably one of the first people within that gym community to start doing my own private blood work because at the time people were like, private blood work, why are you doing this? And obviously, again, with advice and seeing other people around, I wanted to be ahead of everyone as I, like I normally do. And uh, yeah, he supplied me with some testosterone stuff. I did my blood work and then my blood work came back as if it wasn't elevated, it was normal. And I'm like, mate, the stuff you sold me, by the way, legit and everything. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every single one's seen the game, fucking amazing games off of it. Like, it wanted to, like, uh, all the stuff like libido through the roof, like all this type of stuff hitting PV. It's like, why does my blood work say that it hasn't increased at all? I think it's gone down by one mil, right? <laughs> and he was like, what? Was like, oh, must have been a dodgy batch, mate. Sorry, here's some more for me like, on the house type thing. Yeah, let me know how it goes type of stuff. And again, it just comes to that point. You don't know what on earth that person selling you has actually got, yeah? He doesn't know because it's been passed down, passed down, passed down, passed down through different people, yeah? And on top of it, not many people like you talk about blood work not many people are aware of it if i'm honest most people don't even consider it there was a there was a story on instagram a little while ago where a guy um i think it was taking testosterone from quite a well-known like black market testosterone yep brand and uh he was like feeling like shit for like two months got really depressed maybe in three months and he was like couldn't understand why he was like feeling the way he was and he was feeling like shit and he and he was he he got depressed and he was like on about he was he was having suicidal thoughts and all this type of stuff because he was like a long-term bodybuilder sort of thing and then he he went and 
got his blood work done. He, he put his blood work back where he's feeling depressed. So he was like, oh, I, I don't even fucking do it. I'm, not, I'm training shit, everything. When he got his blood work done, he was, he was, he was actually on fucking zero. So the testosterone that he was taking just wasn't testosterone. But he was saying at the time, he was like, I was thinking of killing myself because I felt that bad. You know, and you think, fuck, this bloke nearly killed himself just because his hormones weren't right. Because he thought he was taking it and he wasn't. This goes back to my point about the jujitsu scene, right? You've got one end of the spectrum, Gordon, like, yeah, I'm all open about this. This will get on the fucking gear, right? But he can play for part of private medical. Exactly, which is fine, right? And then on top of it then, like, you've then got this other industry, which I've talked about before, which is like already five, ten years ahead where they all talk about it. They all get their blood work done every fucking week if they could do, yeah? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we've now got people having suicidal thoughts and wanting to kill themselves. I'm like... I don't want history to repeat itself in, in a sport that I love type of thing. Yeah. And that's my biggest concern with it all. I'm not saying, like I said, it can't be used. I'm not saying that at all. It can be done safely and more openly talked about. And I think it just helps a lot more. So do you know what I think would be more useful compared to knowing Gordon Stack is speaking to Gordon's like endocrinologist. <laughs> oh, yeah. That I think is what I think. Not, not It's not to be intrigued in terms of like, what are they taking exactly? I'd be like, okay, how does the blood work look? Would you be concerned with this? Yeah. How was he? How what was his post course therapy like afterwards? Did he come off completely when he was ill? Yeah, because I think if that can be mitigated, then we get to the crux of the problem. But like, I might this might be fucking <laughs> causing a massive dilemma here, like making him feel great all the fucking time type of thing. But you deal with the post course therapy and like the suicidal thoughts, and after that, then you you've got rid of the main big problem. Do you see what I mean? And there's like no more depression. There's no more of this type of stuff. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I don't want that to be an encouragement to just <laughs> focus on PCT only and like stay on steroids for the rest <laughs> of your life. Please don't see it like that. But at least then we'll help towards that sort of bigger picture issue when it comes to that. So, right, boys, I think we're about done. Jay, where can people find you, mate? Basically, we're all over social media. Uh, type in the name BJJ Nutrition onto any social media platform and you will find us. I don't think we're on Snapchat. So I think I'm not like an eight year old girl. Um, <laughs> perspective. Uh, but yeah, Instagram is probably our most prolific on there. You'll see any sort of hype behind the scenes stuff on our stories. Um, obviously, we've got our own podcast as well. It's mm. obviously going to check yeah, us out check on that. there. Uh, YouTube. Anywhere else, Facebook, yeah. And then if you're if we're at local competitions, just come say hi to either me or my producer, Tom, who's just sat in the corner. Um, again, we're always about just have a chat with us. And uh, yeah, I hope obviously you guys have a great competitive season. Uh, and likewise, thanks for having me on, guys. So. Cheers, mate. Definitely check these guys out. Thank Cheers, you, mate. Thank Cheers, you. mate. Thank you, boy.